Lately, I've been absolutely fascinated by the work of Dr. Andrew Huberman, neuroscientist and professor of neurobiology at Stanford University. He and his colleagues have been studying the neurobiology of fear, courage and resilience. And a few months ago, he was on Rich Roll's podcast talking about people he's taken into his lab to study, including cultural icon for extreme resilience, David Goggins. All right, everybody, you see me smiling, why? Because it kind of sucks out here in New York City. David earned his cultural association through transcending his extremely challenging personal life, especially in his formative years, and then subjecting himself to the infamous BUDS training of the Navy SEALs, which is notably highly grueling and oppressive. Plus, throw in multiple ultramarathons into the mix, and it's safe to say he's kind of earned the title of the toughest man alive. And I think something that's important to understand is this relates deeply to all of our lives. What we're able to achieve in our life and the extent to how efficiently we're able to execute on our inner vision and bring it forth in the world is entirely dependent on how much we're willing to transcend fear take those leaps of faith and become resilient in the face of challenge. And so in this video, I'll be breaking down insights from Dr. Andrew Huberman into how David has such extreme resilience. So just a very quick announcement before we get straight into it, a few more slots have opened up for the free one-to-one -one with me to see if you'd be a good fit for the Consciousness Revolution program. So if that interests you, head over to speaktoalex.com or wait till the end of the video for more details. Now I know for myself that how efficient I am with my business, which directly impacts the amount of people that I'm able to positively impact and the money that I make, is directly affected by my ability to focus on something and keep taking consistent action despite the challenges and despite what can sometimes seem like slightly oppressive circumstances. And there'll probably be something similar for you. What actions aren't you taking because of fear? Now, I want you to be really honest with yourself. At the surface, the mind may come in and say, well, nothing, of course. But dig a little deeper and you'll probably find there are many things that you don't do out of wanting to stay comfortable. Apprehension about pushing those boundaries outwards and having that faith and taking the leap into the unknown. Yes, I appreciate we're in particularly oppressive circumstances now with the pandemic and everything else that's going on. But let's be honest, think of your biggest dreams and aspirations you'll probably find the biggest thing standing in your own way is you. I know it's the case for me, so I'm always looking for new information that could help unlock a clearer path forward. And when it comes to the extreme end of resilience, perhaps it's fitting to get some insights from David Goggins. And fortunately, we can look at these insights through the lens of Dr. Andrew Huberman, who's an expert at studying these things from a neuroscience perspective and is proficient at translating them into information that we can apply in our own lives. So what can we learn about how someone like David Goggins has such extreme resilience? Here I've tried to link his very brief section on David and how it relates to explanations he made earlier in the podcast to get some insights. Whatever it is that David has figured out how to do, it clearly involves taking whatever adrenaline pulse he feels and understanding something fundamental to biology, which is that adrenaline response was designed to move us not to keep us stationary. Now, my interpretation of this is informed by something he said earlier in the podcast, where he was talking about the concept of flow, this state where action and awareness become one, and you're often seemingly gliding through activities that would otherwise be highly challenging. And he's highlighting the temptation to think that there's some magic access point or door to that state or any state that requires deep concentration, learning or persistence. When in fact, the reality is that these states are most often preceded by feelings of stress or agitation, this adrenaline response that he's talking about. And David's ability to use this to prompt 
action is what gets him to consistently cross the line, whereas many other people take those sensations and interpret them as a sign of resistance or a sign to give up. But I think we need to get comfortable as a, as a culture in trying to understand our species and how we work, that the early stages of hard work and focus are gonna feel like agitation, stress, and confusion, because that's the norepinephrine and adrenaline system kicking in. None of us would expect to walk into the gym and do our PR lift or you know, a performer go do something without warming up. The brain also needs to warm up and start to hone in which circuits are gonna be active. And it's, it's unreasonable for us to think, oh, I've got an hour, I'm gonna plop down and write mm. beautifully for an hour, my best work. We need to accept that there's a period of agitation and stress that accompanies the dropping into these highly concentrated states. Now, what's important here is that this feeling of agitation and discomfort that precedes a state of deep focus on a challenge can serve as a prompt to carry out behavior instead of trying to change or negotiate the feelings and thoughts. And that's where many of us get stuck, stuck feeling this uncomfortable feeling with our attention contracted down onto uncomfortable thoughts about insurmountable challenge. And eventually the quit response kicks in. We try to negotiate with our thoughts and feelings to drive our behavior, whereas David appears to have programmed himself to go straight to the behavior, straight to action, and probably using feelings of stress, resistance, agitation, and confusion to propel himself to the next milestone through action. Whereas most people, when they don't like what they feel, they start negotiating sensation, which will never work. They start trying to control their perception, which is hard right? They're like, oh, I'm not going to think about that or I'll think about it differently. Very hard to control the mind with the mind. He knows that's a tough one. Yeah. Feelings, Lord knows what those are and how to control them. I mean, we'll eventually figure that out as a field, but thoughts are complicated. So he just goes immediately he to goes action. He goes forward. Immediately right to towards action. And when we do this, when we lean into that discomfort and just carry out the actions, we prompt real brain change, real neuroplasticity. Uh, one of the things I think is very clear is that he's tapped into this neuroplasticity process through the, the door, through the portal of agitation and stress. He's figured out, th and this is really the holy grail of neuroscience, is how can I modify my brain? Well, you modify it by placing yourself into discomfort and using that as a pro propeller to move you into action. So I believe it's really important to recognize here the emphasis on behavior first. And I think that's what it's really highlighting is our propensity to assume that if we just think about things for long enough, or if we think about things in a certain way, we'll eventually change our behavior. Whereas that may be true, but in many circumstances, we can just feel that discomfort and then go for the behavior instead of resisting the sensations or wishing for things to be different we just go for the action. He's figured out that it really doesn't matter if you come at something from a place of joy and love, and a, that would be wonderful. But there's a whole other set of ways to approach this that involve slogging through the discomfort, the doubts, the wish for things to be different, and starting with behavior. And I love this analogy of running the process in reverse. I can think of many, many times in my life that I've thought, if I can just change my thoughts about this, then I will act differently. Whereas I could have just felt the discomfort and then acted differently in order to change my thoughts about it and already know that I'm capable because I just went ahead and did it. Now I'm not underestimating the power of belief. A change in belief is what got me to become a non-smoker, but obviously it was still my behavior that ultimately mattered. Yeah. And it's incredible, because if you think about sensation, perception, feeling, thought, and behavior, actually the way to control our nervous system and feel the way we wanna feel is to run that backwards. Behavior, thoughts. So if you change your behavior, then generally your thoughts, your feelings, and your perceptions change. Yeah. And everyone tries to come at it from the other end, 
But he's figured out through whatever process led him there and incredible life circumstances, how to run it in this direction of behavior first. And this is what David has learned to do in the moment and apply it to what he's focused on. It sucks. It's about seven inches of snow and I'm extremely ecstatic right now. Pain is just a feeling. You see his happiness? Why? Because it sucks. That's why I'm so happy right now. Merry Christmas. He reports thinking, I'm just gonna crush whatever's in front of me. And when he's focusing on that challenge, he's using the discomfort to propel himself into action. Whereas most other people are having all these moments where we're trying to negotiate with our thoughts and our feelings to then be able to take out that courageous action. But when it comes to consistent action on challenging activities or oppressive tasks, behavior first, is the key here. So simple, yet so important to recognize. When it comes to wanting to shift the way that you function, to get better or to perform better or to show up better or to move away from things like addictive behaviors, it's absolutely foolish for any of us, me included, to think that we can do that by changing our thoughts first. It's behavior first, thoughts, feelings, and perceptions follow. Mood follows action. And I love how this beautifully ties in with the realizations I and many others have on the spiritual path. After all, presence is about not talking to yourself in your head all the time, right? Not overthinking. And if you're not overthinking, you're much more likely to just be taking that action. And another realization from this spiritual investigation is that feelings, which are sensations in the body, however intense, cannot harm what you essentially are, which is the presence of awareness. And so if you can be this presence of awareness knowingly, whilst you experience these seemingly uncomfortable feelings that precede states of deep focus and flow, it's going to allow you not to buckle to them so easily and instead stay relatively calm and present. And if you're able to do that, you're able to walk your highest path and consciously create your future. And so with that being said, here's some more detail on the Consciousness Revolution program. On this program, we help you overcome low confidence or low self-esteem that's holding you back from what you really want to do in your life. If you're done with living a mediocre life of the same stuff day in, day out and want to build something that positively contributes to the world and in exchange brings abundance to your life, this program is for you. Or if you're a conscious entrepreneur that's had some momentum but has ran into some blocks and wants help taking things to the next level, this program is also for you. So head over to speaktoalex.com and book a time for us to chat about solving your problems. And with that being said, if you liked this video, of course, like it and don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new videos helping you with conscious personal growth. Peace.